Hi folks, and welcome back to part number three of three for my uh, historic deck production overview. This is looking at people and companies that make historic tarots or historic reproductions uh, in the modern era. So people who are producing tarots as of September of 2023. And if you missed it, uh, be sure to watch parts one and two. I also want to um, pre-thank anyone who's left a comment or um, a suggestion in the comments on those videos. I appreciate engagement. And just a reminder that I don't collect every single uh, historic tech deck out there. Certainly can't afford to do that space-wise, budget-wise, whatever. Um, and I may not have every single um, deck that I'm mentioning or producer, producer that I'm mentioning, but I'll link to all of them and I'll put up pictures where I don't have an example in my collection. So the first uh, organization I want to talk about is the Muse Museo Internazionale de Tarocchi, the International Museum of Tarot, and this is located in Italy. They make uh, a number of different uh, reproductions, not a ton. They do a few. They have a, their own version of the Tarot of Paris. I believe that's their most recent version. Um, this is not their production. This is uh, a different one, but um, they have a version of this deck that's slightly cleaned up, slightly uh, retouched, redrawn. It's a nice version. It also does not have the, the little museum stamp down here on every single card. So I'll put a link to Cheryl Smith's website where she talks about that edition and shows some cards. And I'll also link to the museum's um, gift shop uh, online where you can buy a copy. They also have another deck that's an Italian one that's similar to this Sirocco Bolognese. It's not the Almondo, it's another one, but it, ha it has the four moors in it as well as this one does. So if you're looking for an example along these lines, that one is still in production and still available. It is very, very large cards, but it's it's very beautiful too. So, uh, so there's that one. Then we do have Tarot Sheet Revival. This is um, Sullivan Hisman's company, and he is out of Belgium, where a lot of cards were originally made. Again, he's another one who does not provide you with any kind of case or protective vehicle for your cards. So you sort of have to come up with your own solution. And he does wrap them in paper, that a paper wrapper that he designs himself. So again, I photocopied that paper wrapper to make the decoration for my box. And this is a two-part box that I showed you how to make in a previous video. So I'll link to that again so you can see how to do that. There's some of my measurements in there. So he has a variety of things. I believe he does a Dodal. Um, this is the Budapest Tarot, and he has some other ones. Some are common, like the Dodal, but a lot of them are, are ones that very few other card makers, if any, make. Um, he's the only one right now that's producing a Budapest Tarot, to my knowledge. So um, I bought a couple of his decks. Unfortunately, I really don't like the cardstock at all. It's this kind of artboard, and it's extremely stiff which makes it very, very difficult to shuffle, you know, and it's just not my preference. I do um, appreciate that he he does a nice um, reproduction. He even has this textured, he leaves in the textured background or adds a textured background so, such that this looks like laid paper. So you can see the kind of horizontal lines on, on the cards there. And that's just a nice touch. It's not something you can feel because it's actually a digital print on there, so it's not a texture, but it's something that makes it look like the original kind of paper that this would have been printed on. Historically accurate backs, of course. Um, but yeah, I just don't, I don't like this cardstock. It's too stiff. So it's, it would be one of those things that where it would not bend, not bend, and then it would crease like all of a sudden it would crease if you're not careful. So this is another overhander for me. Fortunately, it's very slidey, so you can overhand or you can mush on a table. You can do this and kind of move them all around and then pick them back up. And that's that's usually what I would do to get a good shuffle. 30 seconds of mushing equals seven riffle shuffles equals 10,000 overhands. And that gives you a good random. So unless you want to do this 10,000 times, you can do one of the other methods to get a good shuffle on decks like this that are hard to shuffle otherwise. Um, but yeah, I, I love this particular deck. It's it's a favorite of mine um, with all the, the sort of cross-eyed people and just the different take on some of the cards. Like this is the, is this the moon card, I think, with Hercules? Um, I can't remember. So uh, here's a double with 
with devil wings and this kind of sporin. This reminds me of like a Scottish, the, the bag that the men would wear around their waist over their kilt. It's just, just really, really cool looking. So I appreciate what Sullivan Hismans is bringing to the tarot marketplace that's unique um, by producing decks that no one else is producing. I just wish he had different cardstock. But I've told him that and he said, oh no, people love my cardstock and they tell me not to change it. So I guess I'm in the minority here, which is fine. You know, we can all have our different opinions. And if he finds that his decks sell well with his cardstock, then hey, that's great. I'll just suck it up and uh, not shuffle these. <laughs> Next up is a company called Tarograph, uh, and I'll just have to put some pictures up here for you because I don't have any of their cards. Um, like uh, some of these other um, independent producers that I've talked about, they have small runs um, and they do historic, various historic reproductions. They will send you the deck wrapped in paper or for an upcharge, they will make a small box for you. And they do say that they uh, hand cut their cards and they print on a textured paper to ensure ancient and artisanal aspects of the shuffling and, and handling experience. And they do ship internationally. They also mention that their decks are reproduced with the agreement of the British Museum. So that might be why they have limited editions because again, they can only, they're only allowed to produce so many of them from those collection images. But yeah, yeah, if you have any cards from Tarograph, please leave a comment and tag me or send send me to your review video because I'd love to see and learn more about this company and see what else that they have. Next up, we have a company that is not really known for their historic tarots, and I almost left them off the list by mistake, but U.S. Games, which is one of the, the biggest publishers, um, certainly in North America, the U.S., and has been around since the early 1970s, does produce some historic decks. And this is an example. They also have a Visconti, uh, several different versions of the Visconti, produced some other ones over the years. I also have their Tarot Classic. It's very much recolored in a modern way. So I thought it would be nice to show that one JJ Swiss um, for this video, because I don't show this much. And this really is a reproduction of the historic deck. So the one JJ refers to uh, Juno and Jupiter, who are here in place of our high priestess and our pope, or papess and pope. And it's funny because this is a Swiss deck, and I know that, but it looks so Italian to me. I have some Italian playing cards that are exactly drawn like this. They have this exact kind of color scheme, similar flesh tones, the etching is all very similar. So it's interesting how this is called a Swiss deck when it really reads to me as more of an Italian kind of deck. But there you have it, uh, the one JJ Swiss. This deck I think is no longer in production or not currently in production from US Games, but it was the first deck that Stuart Kaplan, the founder of US Games, ever had in his collection. And it's the first one that he decided to reproduce. So there are thousands and thousands of copies on the used market. And you can certainly find a, you know, a decent copy for not much money. You can also find people trying to sell this deck for $120 on eBay, so just don't buy those. Um, that's my advice. You know, spend 20, 25, 30 bucks and get yourself a nice copy of the one JJ Swiss. Um, this is the very old US Games cardstock. This one is from when they were still located in New York, and this one's um, produced by A.G. Mueller. So A.G. Mueller was the printing company that U.S. Games was contracting with before they started using other companies. So this kind of cardstock is very papery and it's nice. Um, I like it. It's not coded, however. So just like the very er early versions of the U.S. Games RWS from the 70s, you would want to be careful in using this, uh, especially around any kind of liquid, because the, the ink will just lift right off and the paper will start to peel and disintegrate if you get these cards damp. I also wouldn't use them with like wet hands or, you know, on a very humid day, um, that kind of thing. I'd just be a little bit careful with them. But yeah, it's a really nice production. Again, this is a little bit smaller than the standard tarot size today, so it's a little bit easier to handle. And, you know, the colors from this, um, I got a, a copy that really hadn't been used much, and the colors are still quite vibrant and saturated and nice. And as you just saw me demonstrate, I'll do it one more time, uh, but the shuffle on these is impeccable. So there you go. The one JJ Swiss by US Games. And like I said, they do have, um, while they're more known for their modern tarots, they have some other historic decks that they've made over the years.
Next we have a company that I used to have a deck from and decided I didn't like. Um, they make a bunch of different kinds of tarots, and so um, when I couldn't find Pablo Robledo's Vandenbore, I got impatient and I ordered one from the Cardamancer. I'll link to their big cartel shop below. They used to also sell on Etsy, but I think they moved to a different platform. So the Cardamancer, I think they're out of the Midwest somewhere um, in the U.S., and they make a whole range of different historic tarots, Sibyllas, playing cards, all different kinds of fortune telling cards, all kinds of stuff. So if you're having trouble finding a reproduction and you know, you're looking for a specific era of deck or something like that, they could really be one to look into. They're another one that prints retouched cards on modern cardstock, and I just didn't like their approach to the Vandenbore, I felt like it wasn't historic enough for me. And I think that's just because I had seen pictures of Pablo Robledo's deck and I, I really wanted that and a substitute wasn't, wasn't going to do it for me. So I do have a review of that deck and a comparison to another um, Vandenbore from a previous era and I'll link that video below on my channel. But check out the Cardamancer. You know, they have high quality stuff. Um, it's not the cheapest because they they have each deck run off one at a time and then they have a pretty significant markup. But, you know, this is their livelihood and I don't blame people for trying to make a living off of producing cards for us. So um, no shade there. While it's not for me, it might be for you. It might be something that you're interested in. All right, and the last deck that I can show you from a well-known producer named Yves Renault. He is from France and... His company is called Tarot of Marseille Heritage. He produces specifically French style Marseille decks. So he's quite niche. He doesn't do Italian decks. So I only have one of his because I am not a niche French Marseille kind of collector. I prefer to get, you know, Italian and French and Belgian and German and Swiss decks from, you know, different eras. Um, that's kind of where my collection goes. But I'm happy to have at least one representative example. And this is his Francois Gassman from 1840. Um, he produces these in limited-ish runs, but then he also does re-release them. So I think this is the second print, uh, printing of this, and I got number 280 of 1500. And I'll link him below. One thing I like about his uh, production is that he gives you an information card, and he does it one in English and one in French. I don't know where my French one went, but... It's probably shuffled in by mistake. Anyway, so he gives you two information cards that tell you about the history of the deck and that kind of thing. The cardstock is a bit thicker than some other producers, and that does kind of make it a bit stiffer and a little bit more challenging to shuffle. But I can shuffle this. I can I can do it. I just have to concentrate. It also has a slightly stickier feel, and I, it's hard to describe. It's slightly waxy in feel, so it doesn't feel quite as smooth and slippery as the soapy sort of um, or papery finish. But it's not. It's also not really a rose petal finish either. It's kind of its own thing. I like the way the cards look. They have this nice flat matte finish with very saturated colors. So I enjoy that part of it. But yeah, it's an interesting choice in terms of the card stock and then the finish on top. The thicker cards also do make it a little bit tricky to overhand. And as you can see, they don't, they don't separate really. They kind of stick together in these little clumps. So I do recommend riffling if you can, if you can get your hands around them, um, or break it in, break the deck into two pieces and then shuffle the two parts. I'm going to try to do a riffle and bridge here. I see these are very, very stiff. And I can't bridge them without potentially bending them. So again, riffle, no bridge, but at least you get better randomization this way. And so forth. So yeah, a little concentration needed there. Would I like this better and would I use it more frequently if it was on a different cardstock that wasn't so thick and stiff? Yes. But is it unusable? No. I would say it's sort of between a Sullivan Hisman's cardstock, this one that's like super duper stiff, and then some of the others that I've showed you that are a little bit more flexible. It's kind of an in-between one. Not ideal, but still functional. And if you're into comparing kind of the minutia of different uh, Marseille decks over the centuries and, you know, different uh, renderings of 
designs and, and patterns and things like that, this would be one to really take a close look at because he's got almost every French deck you can think of and, and spans quite a, a wide range of dates. I particularly like this one again because you get these deep navy blues and this lovely sage green like you see here on the temperance card and this this orange is kind of an orangey rusty color rather than a saturated red so I, I appreciate this palette and that's why this is my Yves Renault deck that I have kept. Um, it did also have a burdell for a while that, that he did but again the color palette is more like this it's just blue uh, yellow and red and it didn't have the other accent colors that I really like so I ended up um, selling or trading that one off. Here's an example of another Yves Renault deck. This is the a card from the Chausson of 1736 uh, and it's interesting that this card stock is a bit shinier, a bit more reflective than than this one. So maybe not all of his cards are printed in the exact same way or from the same producer. I know that they are printed in China, and I will say that his are a little bit more affordable. Last time I looked, they were 33 euros plus shipping, so that's a little bit on the more affordable side compared to, you know, 60, 80 plus euros for some of these others. And again, no judgment. Um, it's just economies of scale and, you know, local economics and things like that, that people have to price things in a way that's sustainable for them. So that, again, is Yves Renault, and unlike some of these others, he does actually have an online shop, so you can go and, you know, put things in your cart and click through. I've had mixed results trying to directly order from him, and so if you do have a problem, you can always email them, and they'll send you, like, a PayPal invoice or something, and that also does seem to work. And so the last card producer I want to talk about is kind of an honorable mention. I've, I've presented 20 to you that are actually producing on a fairly regular basis and have multiple productions over the last few years. The last one I want to mention is Shell David of East Tarot. Uh, he's got a great YouTube channel where he shows off his work and he's probably restored 10 or 15 different historic decks at this point. Some of them completely, some of them I think he's done, you know, majors and then sort of gotten on to another project. He's extremely prolific and very creative and, uh, you know, I love his approach to restoring decks, he leaves like messy lines and and you know paint going outside the lines and things like that. He also cleans up the images in a way that they're easier to read. Problem is he won't put any of his damn decks on the internet for sale. He he hasn't uploaded them to any print on demand sites. He's never done a Kickstarter. He doesn't have an online store. He has a link to something on Etsy that says coming soon, but it said that for over two years now, I think. And, you know, he says it's because he's just doing this for fun and it's not meant to be a business and, you know, he has a full-time job and I understand all that, but come on, dude, just like put them up somewhere so we can buy copies because, Shell, your work is so incredibly proficient. You know, it, it, it's got, for me, it's got that balance between the historic accuracy and the modern cleaned up look that, you know, is more readable than a bad, faded blotchy museum facsimile would be. It's like historic tarots that actually look like what they look, should have looked like when they originally printed rather than ones that have aged poorly over 300 years. And I would love to work with them. But unfortunately I don't have a copy. I know a couple of tarot YouTubers who have received copies as gifts or trades from him or you know through the sort of network, the underground network of, of other tarot friends and things like that. And maybe I'm just griping because I'm jealous, um, but I actually think that putting them online and making them available would be really cool because I'm sure there's a lot of people, self-included, that would love to buy some of these. So Shell, if you're listening or if you know Shell and you have his ear, please encourage him and support him in whatever way he might need in order to get some of these things out into the public, into the world, so that we can purchase them. Okay, so that was part three, and that concludes my overview of all of the historic deck producers that are not one of projects that kind of have, you know, a body of work that we can look at. And I just want to, again, thank you all for being along for the ride, and thank you for uh, requesting this. This was a reviewer uh, request originally, so I like it when people interact. I like it when people kind of, you know, prompt me on uh, ideas for videos. That's always a nice thing. I hope this was useful. Uh, I hope it was enjoyable. It was enjoyable for me to get out and um, play with all these uh, because 
you know, I don't read with these every day, but I, I love my historic deck collection. I think it's beautiful. Also, thanks to my mom for the loaner of this deck. I don't actually own any artisan tarot decks myself, but I knew she had a copy of that. So thank you again for being along for the ride. And if you've watched all three parts or, or looked through the, you know, the notes and things on all three parts, and there's any deck producers out there that I've missed that are, that were not just, again, one-off productions, but artists or companies that regularly produce decks, let me know. I'd love to find out, you know, if, if any, any of the ones that, that I mentioned that I didn't have a copy of, if you have copies of those, or if there's good reviews of things, uh, feel free to pop a comment below. And if there's any producers that, you know, I just didn't mention at all that you are aware of, let me know that too. I'd love to find out more. And until next time, thanks again for tuning in and I'll see you later. Bye.